Mr. President, in extending to you the Holy See's congratulations uh, on your election uh, to the presidency of the 69th session of the General Assembly, I wish to convey the cordial greetings uh, of His Holiness Pope Francis uh, to you and to all the participating delegations. He assures you of his closeness and prayers for the work of this session of the General Assembly with the hope that it will be carried out in an atmosphere of productive collaboration, working for a more fraternal and united world by identifying ways to resolve the serious problem which beset the whole human family today. In continuity with his predecessors, Pope Francis recently reiterated the Holy See's esteem and appreciation for the United Nations as an indispensable means of building an authentic family of peoples. The Holy See values the efforts of these distinguished institutions to ensure world peace, respect for human dignity, the protection of persons, especially the poorest and most vulnerable, and harmonious economic and social development. Though mindful of the human person's gifts and abilities, Pope Francis observes that today there is the danger of widespread indifference. As much as this indifference concerns the field of politics, it also affects economic and social sectors, since an important part of humanity does not share in the benefits of progress and is in fact relegated to the status of second-class citizens. At times, such apathy is synonymous with irresponsibility. I recall also the words of His Holiness addressed to the Secretary General at the beginning of August. It is with a heavy and anguished heart that I have been following the dramatic events in northern Iraq, thinking of the tears, the suffering, and the heartfelt cries of despair of Christians and other religious minorities of that beloved land. In that same letter, the Pope renewed his urgent appeal to the international community to take action to end the humanitarian tragedy now underway. He further encouraged all the competent organs of the United Nations, in particular those responsible for security, peace, humanitarian law and assistance to refugees, to continue their efforts in accordance with the preamble and relevant articles of the United Nations Charter. Today, I am compelled to repeat the heartfelt appeal of His Holiness and to propose to the General Assembly, as well as to the other competent organs of the United Nations, that this body deepen its understanding of the difficult and complex moment that we are now living. With the dramatic situation in northern Iraq and some parts of Syria, we are seeing a totally new phenomenon, the existence of a terrorist organization which threatens all states, vowing to dissolve them and to replace them with a pseudo-religious world government. Unfortunately, as the Holy Father recently said, even today there are those who would presume to wield power by coercing consciences and taking lives, persecuting and murdering in the name of God. These actions bring injury to entire ethnic groups, populations and ancient cultures. 
it must be remembered that such violence is born out of disregard for God and falsifies religion itself, since religion aims instead at reconciling men and women with God, at illuminating and purifying consciences, and at making it clear that each human being is the image of the Creator. In a world of global communication, this new phenomenon has found followers in numerous places and has succeeded in attracting from around the world young people who are often disillusioned by a widespread indifference and a dearth of values in wealthier societies. This challenge, in all its tragic aspects, should compel the international community to promote uh, a unified response based on solid juridical criteria and a collective willingness to cooperate from the common good. To this end, the Holy See considers it useful to focus attention on two major areas. The first is to address the cultural and political origins of contemporary challenges, acknowledging the need for innovative strategies to confront these international problems in which cultural factors play a fundamental role. The second area for consideration is a further study of the effectiveness of international law today, namely its successful implementation by those mechanisms used by the United Nations to prevent war, stop aggressors, protect populations, and help victims. Following the attacks of 9-11, when the world woke up to the reality of a new form of terrorism, some media and think tanks oversimplified the tragic moment by interpreting all subsequent and problematic situations in terms of a clash of civilizations. This view ignored long-standing and profound experiences of good relations between cultures, ethnic groups and religions, and interpreted through this lens other complex situations such as the Middle Eastern question and those civil conflicts presently occurring elsewhere. What then are the paths open to us? First and foremost, there is the path of promoting dialogue and understanding among cultures which is already implicitly contained in the preamble and first article of the Charter of the United Nations. This path must become an ever more explicit objective of the international community and of governments if we are truly committed to peace in the world. The natural growth and enrichment of culture is the fruit of all components of civil society working together. International organizations and states have the task of promoting and supporting in a decisive way and with the necessary financial means those initiatives and movements which promote dialogue and understanding among cultures, religions, and peoples. Peace, after all, is not the fruit of a balance of powers, but rather the result of justice at every level, and most importantly, the shared responsibility of individuals, civil institutions, and governments. And yet, we do not face the challenges of terrorism and violence with cultural openness alone. The important path of international law is also available to us. The situation today requires a more incisive understanding of this law, giving particular attention to the responsibility to protect. In fact, 
One of the characteristics of the recent terrorist phenomenon is that uh, it disregards the existence of the states and, in fact, the entire international order. Terrorism aims not only to bring change to governments, to damage economic structure or simply to commit common crimes. It seeks uh, to directly control areas within one of various states, it, to impose its own laws which are distinct and opposed to those of the sovereign state. It also undermines and rejects all existing juridical systems attempting to impose dominion over consciences and complete control over persons. The global nature of this phenomenon, which knows no border, is precisely why the framework of international law offers the only viable way of dealing with this urgent challenge. This reality requires a renewed United Nations that undertakes to foster and preserve peace. Given that the new forms of terrorism are transnational, they no longer fall under the competence of the security forces of any one state. The territories of several states are involved. Thus, the combined forces of a number of nations will be required to guarantee the defense of unarmed citizens. Since uh, there is no juridical norms which justifies unilateral policing actions beyond one's own borders, there is no doubt that the area of competence lies with the Security Council. My delegation wishes to recall that it is both licit and urgent to stop uh, aggression through multilateral action and a proportionate use of force. As a, a representative body of a worldwide religious community embracing different nations, cultures and ethnicities, the Holy See hopes that the international community will assume a responsibility in considering the best means to stop all aggression and avoid the perpetration of new and even graver injustice. It is uh, paramount uh, that there be a unity of action for the common good, avoiding the crossfire of vetoes. As His Holiness wrote to the Secretary General on 9th of August last, the most basic understanding of human dignity compels the international community, particularly through the norms and the mechanism of international law, to do all that it can to stop and to prevent further systematic violence against ethnic and religious minorities. While the concept of the responsibility to protect is implicit in the constitutional principles of the Charter of the United Nations and of humanitarian law, it does not specifically favor a recourse to arm. It asserts, rather, the responsibility of the entire international community in a spirit of solidarity to confront heinous crimes such as genocide, ethnic cleansing, and religiously motivated persecution. Here with you today, I cannot fail to mention the many Christians and ethnic minorities who in recent months have endured atrocious persecution and suffering in Iraq and Syria. Mr. President, with uh, Resolution A-68-6 of the 68th Section of the General Assembly, it was decided that this present session would discuss the post-2015 Development, development Agenda, to be then formally adopted in the 17th session in September 2015. You yourself, Mr. President, aptly choose the main theme of this present session, 
delivering and implementing a transformative post-2015 development agenda. During your recent uh, meeting with all the chief uh, executives of, ag of agencies, funds and programs of the United Nations, uh, His Holiness requested uh, that future objectives for sustainable development be formulated with generosity and courage, so that they can have a real impact on the structural causes of poverty and hunger, attain more substantial results in protected environment, ensure dignified and produ productive labor for all, and provide an appropriate protection for the family which uh, is an essential element in sustain sustainable human and social development. Specifically, this involves uh, challenging all forms of injustice and uh, resisting the economy of exclusion, the throwaway culture, and the culture of debt. In this regard, the Holy See welcomes the 17th Sustainable De Development Goal proposed by the Working Group, which seek to address the structural causes of poverty by promoting dignified labor for everyone. Equally, the Holy See appreciates that the goals and targets, for most part, do not, do not echo wealthy population fears regarding population growth in poorer countries. It also welcomes the fact that the goals and targets do not impose on poorer states lifestyles which are typically associated with advanced economies and which tend to show a disregard for human dignity. The responsibility to protect, as stated earlier, refers to extreme aggressions against human rights, cases of serious contempt of humanitarian law or grave natural catastrophes. In a similar way, there is a need to make legal provision for protecting people against other forms of aggression, which are less evident but just as serious and real. For example, a financial system governed only by speculation and the maximization of profits, or one in which individual persons are regarded as disposable items in a culture of waste, could be tantamount in certain circumstances to an offense against human dignity. It follows, therefore, that the UN and its member states have an urgent and grave responsibility for the poor and excluded, mindful always that social and economic justice is an essential condition for peace. Mr. President, each day of the 69th session of the General Assembly, and indeed of the next four sessions up until November 2018, will bear the sad and painful memory of the futile and inhuman tragedy of the First World War, a senseless slaughter, as Pope Benedict XV referred to it, with its millions of victims and untold destruction. Marking the centenary of the start of the conflict, His Holiness Pope Francis expressed his desire that the mistakes of the past are not repeated, that the lessons of history are acknowledged, and that the causes for peace may always prevail through patient and courageous dialogue. Mr. President, in making my own the sentiments of the Holy Father, I fervently hope that they may be shared by all. I offer to each of you my best wishes for your work while trusting that this session will spare no effort to, to put an end to the clamor of weapons that marks existing conflicts and that uh, it will continue to foster the development 
of the entire human race and in particular the poorest among us.